Thank you very much for that introduction. It made me a little sad to realise actually it's 44 years now and I need to update date my CV. But um, that's what happens when you start shoeing at five years old, you see. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm, uh, you are all guinea pigs here today because uh, I've spoken at the TBA course in Newmarket in December. Goodness knows I think I'm the only surviving speaker from the 80s. And, um, and I usually speak about Farriery and uh, conformational problems and how Farriery can help. Uh, what I've been doing the last five or six years is actually trekking all the way up here, up the wonderful M6, and I'm sure many of you appreciate that road, uh, to Preston, 30 miles north of here. And initially I did a part-time Bachelor of Science, and for the last five years I've been doing a part-time PhD project. And it's, thank goodness, coming towards the end. Um, but the good thing is I've got lots of information, and so you're guinea pigs because this is the first time I've presented 90% of this information, and it is all on thoroughbred hooves. And I hope some of the information uh, is of use to the industry and will help us produce sounder, stronger hooves, more suitable to the rigours that we expect our horses or our horses' hooves to endure. But we shall see. So I'm going to go through a number of topics, and I realise even this list looked um, pretty uh, long. Uh, briefly at anatomy, I'm not going to dwell on that. Uh, we're going to look at the hoof wall and uh, some of its attributes. Uh, and then I'm going to look, as I say, in the main title at hoof development uh, and how that changes. I'm going to go all the way back to an embryo uh, and take us through mainly, most of my project was uh, up to four months of age, but I have looked a little bit, on the, a little bit beyond that at yearlings because... There's always this argument when you say anything about foals, it's almost like, well, they're a different species, especially till they're a month old. And I understand that sometimes that's a good thing, just to leave well alone till they're a month old. But I, I also have to defend some of the things I find. And I knew one of the arguments would be, oh, that's just, that's just uh, foals. So I've looked beyond that at yearlings and found some interesting stuff, weanlings and yearlings. Whose structure is very important. Um, I particularly focused on hoof growth and hoof renewal. Now, farriers are very interested in hoof growth because they will be the first ones to complain if they don't have hoof to work with, just like they're the first ones to complain if actually they've got too much hoof to work with. But hoof renewal is something different, and that's something that you should be interested in. And so when we get there, I hope I'll make it clear what is um, why the industry and why it should help you, veterinary surgeons and farriers. Hoof shape, of course, you know, we're uh, always, always at the sales these days and people do take into account conformation and the, hoof sh and the shape of hooves. Now, studies over 30 or 40 years have all shown a similar thing, that 70% of lamenesses is in the foot or related to the foot. So it may be that it's in the leg, but it's related to the foot. Many other studies have shown that there is a close relationship between hoof shape and lameness. Now, there's always this chicken and egg, which comes first? Does the foot change shape because of the lameness, or is the lameness due to the foot shape? But nevertheless, it's, there's a quite uh, a, a well-established link between hoof shape and unsoundness. And although I've seen horses win with the most peculiar shaped feet, I'll tell you something, they don't win too many races when they're stuck in the stables because they're lame. We're going to look at hoof angles because, again, we all judge horses by the angle of their pastons and their hooves, and we've been doing that for about two and a half thousand years that we know of. I'm interested in how horses bear weight on their hooves because I'm sure, and I think I'll be able to show, that this does have an impact on their hoof shape, and that loading changes particularly in young foals. And... Part of my studies was comparing the hoof growth of horses with flexural, or I should say foals with flexural deformities, and uh, especially the club foot, and a, a group of healthy, supposedly normal foals. So this is a, a, an unusual anatomical um, view because it's oblique, and you can see both the internal and external structures. Uh, but 
the most important, of course, is the distal phalanx here, which is the main bone residing within uh, the hoof capsule, part of the middle phalanx, or short pattern as it's often known, and we can see here the navicular bone or distal sesamoid. This is this huge plantar or palmar cushion full of fatty tissue, and its main purpose would appear to be to protect this very important area here and the insertion of the tendon. The hoof wall that I'm interested in, of course, is uh, uh, generated from the coronary band. And it grows down mainly because it's pushed down by new cells being generated. And of course, that occurs the, the entire life of the horse. Um, so we can sometimes confuse hoof generation and hoof growth. You might think at the moment that's the same thing. It isn't the same thing. The amount that the horse generates and what arrives at the bottom are not necessarily uh, synonymous. Uh, down here we can see the white line, sometimes called the white zone, which is this elasticated horn which joins the, sole, uh, sorry, the hoof wall to the sole. And the reason that's elasticated is for a fairly obvious reason, is that every step your horse takes, the sole descends uh, and the hoof moves sideways. So there are two uh, parts of this structure are moving in different directions. And if they're not joined by something that's elastic, they are going to rip apart. And of course, occasionally we do get problems along the margins uh, of the white line. So what do we know about the hoof wall? Well, we probably know a lot more than I'm able to tell you, but we know it has a tubular structure. And that slide you see there is a transverse section, so it's cut across the hoof wall, and we're looking down the hoof wall, and we can see all these tubules. So the tubules are almost straw-like structures, which in a healthy hoof uh, are parallel. Uh, they are surrounded by intertubular horn, which is pretty much the same material. It's just organised in a different fashion. And then in the middle of those horn tubules, there is uh, intratubular horn, which again is pretty similar, uh, but that is a very disorganised horn and just fulfills those hollow tubes. At the bottom of the picture, you can see the lamellae. And the lamellae is that structure that suspends your horse's weight within its hoof capsule. We can sometimes look at a horse's hoof and we almost imagine it's like our foot in our shoe. That is not the way the hoof works. We'd be better off thinking of it as a tube with the skeleton stuck on the inside of that tube and it's stuck there by the lamellae. So it's effectively suspended in its own hoof. And of course we know uh, that in cases of laminitis when this um, junction fails, we can have catastrophic and even life-threatening uh, uh, problems. So we also can see that this tubular structure, uh, sorry, I've already said that, but the tubular structure uh, is anastropic and heterogeneous. So what does that mean? Heterogeneous means that it's not the same, and you can see it from that picture. It's not the same from the inside of the hoof wall to the outside. Those horn tubules, uh, there are some small ones close to the lamellae, then they're large and round, then they become more oval, and then they become very small and oval. Uh, and anastropic means that they, it has different strengths in different directions. So it's not like, should we say, a piece of steel that you would expect to be able to take the same tension, the same compression, whichever direction you tested it. So it has differences, and it almost certainly has those differences because that suits the horse. They say it flexes every time the horse moves, uh, and if you talk to a material... A property specialist and told them that you wanted to produce a material that would be flexed a hundred thousand times in a year and still survive, they would tell you it's not possible to do it. So the hoof, we sometimes focus on its problems. It's actually an extraordinarily successful uh, and useful material. It is a very, very strong material. So it's tough and durable. Pretty much it arrives at the ground here in most horses as strong as it left here when it was generated. And we see a growth ring here. It produces growth rings. And you see that on the, your horses, whether you change the environment of the horse, whether you change the feed, whether the horse is ill, you'll get a growth ring at the same point, uh, recording that problem, and that will slowly grow out, and it will be on all four feet. Uh, so sometimes, well, for a hoof nerd like me, that's a useful thing. And as I say, it constantly regenerates. So it's the whole life of your horse it is regenerating this hoof. 
So I said I'd start early. Well, uh, this is a, I think it's 25 or 23 day old embryo and we can't see a hoof on it. It is a horse. We can't tell it's a horse. At this age, it, whether it was a dog or a human, it would look the same. But you'll just have to take my word for it that it's a horse and it already has its front legs. It doesn't have hind legs. But Amir, six weeks later, at about two months, I think this one's 65 days, you can see it's a horse. And one thing in particular gives the game away. It has a single toe on each foot. So it might be a donkey or it might be a zebra. But when I say horse, I mean equidae. And that's the unique thing about our horses. It's probably the only unique thing. I mean, everybody in this room, I'm sure, loves them and is fascinated by them as I am. You're probably not quite as fascinated by the hooves as I am. But that's the thing that sets it apart. It has a single toe. <coughs> Just another month later, uh, we can see that there's bone, bone formation uh, within the limbs and you can actually see some of the cannon bone and if you look carefully, you can see that distal phalanx starting to form. So very early on, this is occurring and it has to occur early on and in the 11 month gestation period, it has to produce a foal that's ready to go. And this little foal is, has stood up in about 30 minutes and is ready to suckle from its mother. And again, that's not unique like the single hoof, but it is quite remarkable. Obviously other large herbivores have to do the same because they have to avoid predators and they have to follow their herd as soon as they're born. Now, if we compare that with humans, and of course children lay on their back and scream for about eight months, or so I'm told, I have got four children, but I made sure I never witnessed that part of their development. Horses seem far more easy to manage. So that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in an animal that stands up immediately after birth, puts this hoof capsule under stress. Here's the other thing. Now, somebody one day might prove me wrong, but it's been reported in other papers, and I believe this strongly, they are all born with perfectly formed symmetrical hooves that are paired left and right. Now, how many horses, by the time they reach one year, have perfectly symmetrical and perfectly paired hooves? I think it's unlikely we have any. So that's the question that, that sort of confronted me was, why do they change? We can see a two-day-old hoof here, still covered a little bit by this deciduous hoof, but it's pretty much a symmetrical hoof there at two days old. A nine-month fetus there is showing this uh, deciduous hoof here, which undoubtedly is there to protect the uterus. Here it is in a neonate. And of course, in a healthy foal, it is shed within days. You could see it on that two-day-old foal that had only been in a barn, and it was almost gone. It was gone from around the hoof wall. So it, it, it's there for a reason while the foal's in the uterus, but shed extremely quickly. All right, back to growth rings. As I say, growth rings uh, represent an event in a horse's life. And this one has two, because it was a yearling that moved stud and shortly after it moved stud, it became ill. So that's why it has two lines and it had those two growth rings on the same point on all four feet. But what is the most important day in any animal's life? And I've sort of given the clue away earlier. I think the day they're born is the most dangerous and the most important. So we shouldn't be surprised that all our foals have a mark on their hoof marking that day of birth. Now, <coughs> it was only recognised by two uh, writers before me, maybe because it's one of the most boring things in the world, but uh, I actually think one got it wrong because he called it a groove, and a groove is where material's removed, and if you look carefully, and I'll have a slide later, there's no material removed from this. And the other one called, and I'd have to say I think it was the farriers were as bad because it was a new market vet, and we always used to call this the foal foot, and people probably still do, where well, it's actually the wrong way round, because up here is the foal foot, this is the fetal hoof. This is what was grown within the uterus. And there is a difference. There's, there's a slide of two halves. Uh, and we can actually even see a change in thickness. And we can see that crease uh, there. So, so we can recognise the day the foal is born. And there's quite a change from uh, non-weight-bearing here in the uterus to weight-bearing here. 
That isn't just to do with weight bearing, of course. We have to recognise that nutrition changes consider considerably and the delivery of it does. Now, another slightly nerdy thing happens uh, to foals' hooves. They sometimes change colour the day after they're born. And here we can see a foal that was born with light coloured hooves decides it's going to have dark coloured hooves. The other thing about this foal hoof crease is that where there is a flexural deformity it is clearly an area of weakness and we get this sudden change in angle and it helps us recognise that that's there and it's undoubtedly due to leverage. If you kept levering on your fingernail it would stick out a little bit further if you persistently did it and that's what's occurring there. But I used this line uh, for my first uh, study. I uh, did a very simple thing. I looked about two years ago at uh, roughly 150 foals as I was going around trimming. And if I could see that line before I trimmed the foal but it wasn't there afterwards, I took the name of the foal, the date of its birth and the day that happened. And from that, it was quite easy to work out that foals, on average, replace this hoof capsule in 145 days, which is about four and a half months. Now, while I was carrying out the study, I was asking some of my contemporaries in Newmarket, how long do you think this will take? And we all knew hoof grew fairly quickly in foals, but they just about all guessed at six months. But it was even quicker than that. So that's a very rapid replacement of the whole hoof capsule. And I might come to a question later as why that's happening. So I actually carried out another study a bit later, and this was slightly harder to do because I didn't have a natural mark telling me when that foal was born, so I had to make my own mark. And I tested weanlings and yearlings, and I started in December, so you'll have a rough idea of how old they are. And I carried it on through till about June, July. And what we found was that it was 283 days, plus or minus 29 days. So it was almost twice as long. By the time they're yearlings, it takes almost twice as long. Now the only other, and people have guessed at this all the time, but the only other person that's actually done mature horses, and these were Lipizzaners, uh, was uh, Henrietta Josek in Austria. And she says a mature horse takes 11 months to grow a new hoof, and I think that's probably about right. If anybody had asked me before I'd read her paper, I would have said a year. There may be some variation in breeds, but I get this feeling that whether you've got a Shetland, a Thoroughbred or a Shire, these things seem to take about the same time. And looking at some of the other data that other people have done. And I'm still going to come back to that. And I hope if, if any of you haven't got why that's important, I'm going to try and make it sound as if it's important. Um, I did a microscopy study of foals' hooves. And I started, I had this, uh, it, it's quite sad really, because I can only chop the hooves up of the dead foals, of dead foals now. It is remarkable, I think, if I learnt something was, of course, it, it is a very dangerous day in the foal's life. I had no problem getting foals of zero age. But, of course, we know that if, they, if, if they're within the uterus till they're 10 months old, the likelihood is they're going to get there till 11 months and be born. And if they survive that first week, the likelihood is they are going to survive. So, even in Newmarket, there's a large population of foals and... Fortunately, there is one collector of uh, all these uh, cadavers, uh, the jockey club. Um, I still had a problem getting enough. But I, in the end, I did get enough. And so I was able to look at a range from 10-month uh, foetuses uh, through to four-month-old foals and just see how it changed. And I wanted to understand what some of the changes were. So this is those lamellae again, and that's the outer hoof wall. So I had a nice little computer program where I could click, at least, and, and I know they're all ones, but the computer pro program, thank goodness, was counting every time I clicked. That's uh, one millimetre, those two lines are apart, so it's quite easy. Even my math stretches to being able to work out area and density. So in other words, how many, how many of those horn tubules uh, per square millimetre. I also picked the largest horn tubules, uh, sorry, that's the measurement of width. And I measured three, because it's better to measure three and measure them three times. And I wanted to see whether these horn tubules grew. Now, you might think this is an esoteric study, and to some extent it is, but the more we understand about the structure, the more likely are we, are, we are to hit upon some 
answers to, to some questions. But my question was this. It was a quite simple one. Since we know the hoof wall thickens during uh, maturation, how does it thicken? We know these horn tubules exist. So is it like a forest? Do they get bigger? Or is it like a forest that saplings grow up in between them? Or, and this doesn't happen in a forest, do those horn tubules just get bigger and get wider apart? So I wanted to know what happened, because there's been studies on mature horses, so I had something uh, to compare with. And that really is uh, quite a... I'm not sure why I put it in this, but it basically it's a principal component analysis, and it actually just gives me an idea of where the data's heading. And if you look, I've got fetus, neonate, so that's at zero at birth, naught to two months, and after two months. And there is a movement in this direction in tubal diameter and epidermal width. Well, as I say, we'd be surprised if the hoof didn't get wider. But the horn tubules do get bigger. And, and there is a lessening in density. So that gave me an idea of uh, where I had to go with examining my data. And I'm sorry if I have to keep turning around here. In a year or two, I should know this stuff off pat. But. So the epidermis width, uh, and so that's the medial dorsal and lateral. So in other words, if we were looking at the horse's foot like this, medial, dorsal, lateral. And that's how I tried to keep all my graphs. Now, in a, uh, in a mature horse, the medial side is wider. But in the foals, it's the same. Now, we shouldn't be surprised that the toe is thicker there. And so people often look at this bow shape and they know it, it helps to, uh, for the foot to move and flex. And probably the toe's thicker because there's often more wear there, but we can't be sure. But that was the first hint that there was a difference, was that studies of mature horses are not the same as that. They are thicker medially where they bear more weight. So since we now know foals, um, uh, young foals are not like that, the question then has to, ask, has to be asked, does that mean they're pre-programmed to change? Or does it mean they change in response to their weight bearing? That might be an interesting question for another time. In other words, uh, the, the foal or the horse that toes in and bears more weight on the outside of its hoof wall, would we find that that side becomes thicker and stronger in mature horses? Especially now that we can see that foals start pretty symmetrically uh, from their, their hoof wall thickness. So then I looked, as I said, at the largest horn tubules, and actually the, the, the horn tubules are not even evenly spread around that hoof capsule. They are far larger at the toe. And I have to say that is similar to mature horses. But again, what isn't similar is this similarity here, uh, where they are wider medially. So they're not the same as mature horses. And then finally, the tubular density, again, is not the same as mature horses. It's as we might think horn, mature horses ought to be. In other words, it's very symmetrical in the foals. Uh, and it is uh, denser there on the medial and lateral side of the foot and less dense at the toe. Now, I think the reason for that might be is that although you might think those tubules add strength, and in a longitudinal way they do add strength, but they don't resist cracking. And I don't know if any of you have seen a foal's hoof cracked at the side, because I'm not sure that I have, but I see plenty that crack at the toe. So it may be that they have, if they have less tubular density, that means they have greater intertubular density, and it's known that intertubular horn resists cracking. So that may well be the way these foals are trying to resist cracking at the toe. Uh, I did a, a thing, something that is, is actually quite an original finding, and it, my, my university was quite amazed that I thought of doing this, but you know, I've been a farrier for 44 years. I wanted to see if as the hoof grew down the hoof wall, as it's pushed down by more and more growth, did it compress? And I looked everywhere, and in scientific literature, literature nobody has suggested that so. But the reason I wondered if it's so, and I don't know how many of you had a horse uh, with a seedy toe area, and you look at it and it's about halfway down the hoof and you think, well, 
hooves take about a year to grow out, that'll take about six months. And it's a bit like a watched kettle never boils. It seems to take longer and longer and longer to get to the bottom. And I, first of all, when I noticed this, I used to think for years it was this watched kettle never boils. And then I thought, it's not possible that hoof grows slower as it gets lower to the bottom. It's been produced at the top. But that is actually what's happening. It's compressing. So I was able to show uh, on my weanly yearlings that these two marks, points, got closer together and therefore as the hoof grew it was compressed. And that might give us more understanding about how these hooves change shape. So, uh, as the hoof wall matures, it thickens, as I say, no big surprise, the horn tubule numbers increase, so there becomes more and more of these. So it is introducing horn tubule, and they appear to be being introduced in this area. Uh, they increase in diameter, so not only is there more of them, they get bigger, but they also get further apart. So actually, it's, it's not that exciting. In fact, it's the three things that I could guess at happening and all three of those are happening to make this hoof wall uh, wider. I'm sure some years down the line I'll think of something else, but that'll be too late. All right, why is it important uh, to understand uh, hoof renewal? Now, I can give you some figures on how, how quickly hoof grows. But you know, if I told you your foal's hoof is growing at 0.42 mil per day, that's not going to mean a lot to you, is it? Standing on a on a rainy stud farm and talking about your foal. But if your foal has an injury to its hoof, and I can tell you that it's going to take about three months to grow out, that might be of an interest to you. Because for all of us, when we have any injury, first of all, we want to know if it can be, fi if it can be fixed. And secondly, our second question is always, well, how long will it take? So that's why I, I think that's of use uh, clinically uh, to veterinary surgeons and, and to you that you have a better idea if you've got sales coming. You, you have an idea of how long this is going to take to grow a new hoof or for that injury to grow out. Now these are not all my hoof growth rates and I said I'm not going to bore you with the speed but these at the top are and this is just how fast your foal's hooves are growing. This is look 100 months in age and so anyway eight or nine years of age and so it's sort of levelling off. But we get this curve here of slowing hoof growth rate. All right, so the question comes, why so fast? Why do foals renew their hooves so quickly and why do their hooves grow so quickly? And I can, I can only really think of two things. The first is that foal that stands up and follows its herd. It doesn't matter too much to our thoroughbreds in our lovely little paddocks. But to the... To the natural horse and the feral horse, that's very important. And feral horses in Australia, unbelievably, have been recorded. New foals, young foals have been recorded working, walking over 17 kilometres a day. Quite, quite remarkable. <coughs> our foals, our thoroughbred foals, have been recorded in large paddocks doing uh, over 7 kilometres a day. So even domesticated thoroughbred foals do a lot. So in other words, if they've got to follow their mother for that amount of time, and not maybe in a lush paddock, there's a lot of erosion of the hoof. And therefore I think they have to generate hoof uh, to overcome this. The other thing is, and I know uh, this is uh, uh, Joe's department, and I saw in the notes that he talked about uh, development and increase in weight. The thing that stunned me about foals increase in weight is the fact that they're somewhere around 50 kilos when they're born, and one month later they have doubled their weight. And two months later they've tripled their weight. That's quite remarkable. Now, here's the problem. They're still walking on that little foot that they developed in the uterus, as they will do for four and a half months. I've shown that. So that's a real problem for them. The other problem is these bones are expanding at such a rate. You know, our fingernail does not wrap around our finger. It doesn't constrict it at all. But the hoof capsule really does quite constrict, certainly that last bone, the distal phalanx, and slightly the uh, short pastern, the middle phalanx. So I, almost, I think it's almost like a snake having to shed its skin in order to expand. And we know the hooves aren't shed and they can't be shed, 
But that's the only two reasons I can come up with for this both rapid rate of growth and uh, very rapid hoof renewal. OK, hoof shape. <coughs> we normally say that a hoof, and we know there's variations in breed, and we all complain about our flat-footed thoroughbreds, but by and large, the horse, the horse's hoof has been described as an oblique truncated cone. So in other words, uh, it leans back, it's cut off at two angles, but it's basically a cone. And about five or six years ago, uh, two researchers in the States uh, described it more in folds and said uh, that it's an inverse cone in folds. And you can see that in that picture. And actually, usually on one of the studs, at least once a year, because sometimes this is more obvious than other, I get somebody saying, what's up with my foal? It seems to be getting thinner at the toe. Well, it's not getting thinner at the toe. What's happening is it's really widening at the top quite quickly. And so we get that effect, and you can see. So it's an inverse cone. But I actually think that's not strictly true, because I think the foal is born, and the ones I've observed, with actually a cylindrical foot. So it's going through quite a change, if that's so. Starts as, as a cylinder, becomes an inverse cone, because it's wider at the top, and then finally it settles down into this shape. We shouldn't be surprised about other shape change. Uh, the distal phalanx here in a 10-month fetus, so one, one month from birth, neonate, at birth, we can see this almost looks like an arrowhead, very, very uh, pointed shape, um, still quite pointed at birth. And actually, if you look at some of the foals hooves, they are quite a pointy shape. They're not the, the round or oval shape we expect um, in mature horses. But by four months, we can see it is becoming a lot more rounded. So even within our false hoof capsule, that distal phalanx is undergoing shape change, um, including, look, this is, I've tried to calibrate these the same, uh, a quite extraordinary increase in size. So I think that's what's going on from the shape change from the point of view of the hoof capsule, in that we start with a uh, cylinder, we go to an inverted cone, and finally, at about nine months, we end up uh, with, with the um, shape we are used to. Now, I'm going to come out of this because I have a video uh, that all I've got to do is find it. Somewhere there, it should say, oh, let's see, I can't even read from there. Have we got a video? Uh, so it and Pollard. Now, when I sent my first paper to Chris Pollard, who, of course, is this, extraordinary uh, academic and, and clinician in Australia who's told us more about laminitis than I think every other researcher put together. Uh, he sent me this in return, made by one of his students, a lady called Tracy Sowood. And this is a time-lapse video of a foal from one week old all the way through uh, until yearling, for the first year of its life. Uh, and we can see how the pigmentation has come in uh, OK, it got a, um, an abscess break at the coronary band, and you can see that. Uh, and now you finally see this shape um, open out and become the shape we are more used to uh, in, our, in our horses. All right, I'm going to show it one more because I should have talked to you about it before. Uh, if you look carefully, you'll see that line grow down. Uh, you'll see this where it opens out at the top. And then as that line, the foal hoof crease, disappears, it's almost like it releases the hoof, and out it comes. So I'll just do it one more time. This is, um, whenever I show this to farriers, uh, they always ask to have it seen again. I, I call it hoof porn for farriers. So, uh, uh, you know, my wife's always banging on my office door and saying, you playing that video again? <laughs> so, uh, OK, down comes the line. There you can see it. Uh, in the middle, it's about a third of the way down now. Do you see how the hoof's opened out at the top? All right, it gets that injury there. Gets a... Now it's gone suddenly, opening out, the, the hoof uh, opens out and, and then starts to take on the shape uh, that we are uh, used to seeing. OK. I could have a...
Yes, so uh, Balka and Bidwell, or I should say Bidwell and Balka, uh, they, they pointed out that these hooves are symmetrical and evenly paired uh, when they're born, and I totally agree with that. And as I say, the question then is, why do they change? Well, we all have uh, different conformational issues with our foals, and this foal here I use in a lot of my lectures because it is that oddity, it is a fetlock valgus. In other words, it's angled out from the fetlock. That isn't a trick of the eye, it isn't because of the angle the picture's taken or it has an outward rotation. It has a genuine angulation, and we can see that here if I put some lines on there. But the most important thing is this is a six-week-old foal. Look at the shape of the hoof. In six weeks, it's already distorted to a considerable amount. It is pushing over this medial side, pushing out the lateral side. It's higher here. It's pushing this part down, shunting this. So lots of changes going on there, even in the first weeks of life because of this conformation. You, can, you get an idea of its age because now you can see this foal hoof crease on every foot. All right, I had the opportunity to use a pressure mat. My university, if they told me once, they told me 20 times that this kit is worth £20,000. They never stopped telling me. And so I told them that I was really going to try and find a foal that was worth less than that to stand on their pressure mat, which finally shut them up. But of course, pressure mats are used more for human um, analysis in medicine and in sport, but they have been used over time of recent years in equine uh, science. I used it just to stand my little foals on there. We tried walking them, it was an impossible task. I couldn't get my clients to accept that and I understand uh, there's a danger. They, you know, my stud farms in Newmarket have been wonderful help. This is my laboratory, not uh, sterile and white, but a converted double stable. What I like about this foal is, and it's the only one I videoed because I usually had to help too much, and you can see it's quite labour intensive. This foal looks like it spent its time in the uterus planning uh, a training for this job. On it goes, look at that. I have to tell you they aren't all quite that cooperative, but we only, uh, well, we only use them if, they, if it was safe, and I had one of these foals that decided it, it couldn't make up its mind whether it was going to kill one of us or itself, so we excluded it from uh, the test. And... Um, and we kept the foal on there for 20 seconds. Uh, that's 50 hertz, so it was taking 50 images a second. To give you an idea, that gave me 59,000 lines of Excel data, which is why even I realised at times we do need computers to analyse some of the stuff. And we did that three times. And then the technician there, who actually is my youngest daughter, she decided what had least, had least sway, so in other words, least mo movement, and we used that. So this is the first image that I got, and this is a little foal when in my enthusiasm it was, uh, it was a pilot study. There it is in February, mud on the, on the hooves, and we stood it on there. And when we got it back, we couldn't actually remember which way round it must have been facing. And then we finally realised that this is the toe and this is the heel. And you can see that, the toe's not on the ground, but it's leaning back on the heels. And although at about three weeks it shouldn't have probably been leaning back that much, um, it showed clearly in the visual data. Now I get visual data, and of course I get the numeric data that I talked about, and visual is nice for this sort of thing, but it's the numeric data that we can analyse. But this is pretty typical, that two and a half weeks later, uh, you can see the change in the loading, and foals always have a tendency to load cordially, in other words on the heel, and they load medially up the inside. So now if loading, has an effect on foot shape, and that's typical of foals, we should anticipate a change in, in the foot shape. And that does seem to be typical. Uh, people, it's been observed and it's been suggested, but it is nice to actually measure it. And so again, this is fairly typical of a foal at 12 hours old, leaning back on its heels, and in two weeks. So this one was a lot quicker than the other. But undoubtedly, if this had been stood on the pressure mat, you would have seen that it's still loading a lot more at the back of the foot. I also did a study where I, I wanted to have 30 foals, but things never quite worked like that. I had 22, and we radiographed them and measured their feet uh, in June and November. And uh, we took these fairly conventional um, uh, measurements here uh, to compare and see changes. Now, the hoof pattern axis, which I think I said earlier, was actually first 
mentioned by my namesake, Simon of Athens, and was written about by Xenophon, the great Greek cavalry general, as a way of assessing horses. So two and a half thousand years ago it was used. But of course, things have changed now, and we can actually look inside the horse. What we couldn't do before uh, was uh, see the phalangeal axis. And in mature horses, it is expected and anticipated that this axis is the same as this. But in foals, it doesn't seem to be the case. Now, what I showed was that between June, all in the same day of June, but they're different ages, and November, there is a straightening of these two lines. So in other words, foals are quite broken forward. So the hoof wall is at a steeper angle than the pastern. But this is occurring as they develop. So it hasn't quite got to zero by the time I finish this study, but it was sort of heading there. I have to say, with the phalangeal axis, um, the data was, uh, was, should we say, to put it in layperson's terms, all over the show. So I couldn't really use that as such. I got some really nice data on this dorsal hoof wall angle, and I've combined it here with Anderson and McElwraith, who are two uh, researchers from the States. And you can see we get this beautiful curve showing my little foals up here at three months old, just how steep this dorsal hoof wall is, and then heading down there to uh, a two-year-old thoroughbred. So these are all thoroughbreds, and it's tracing this descent. So it was nice to be able to combine the data like that and look at it. But the important thing here is these were over 59%, their mean dorsal hoof wall angle. There's two textbooks that I know of that will tell you your horse at 60 degrees angle has a club foot. So all I'm saying is that is nonsense. Half of my foals did not have a club foot. That may well be um, a de definition you can use in mature horses, but if you use something as simple as that in foals, you're going to get it wrong. So I also uh, looked on my pressure mats between two groups, a control group of uh, 18 foals and uh, a group with acquired flexural deformity, in other words, heels up of nine, and we put them, so they look something like this. Uh, this one would be typical of one that I would ask for permission to put on the pressure mat uh, and measure it at least three times. And you can see there, there's a picture of it on the left, the video on the right, shows you that this foal cannot put its heels on the ground. And so we were able to look at these. Uh, before I say that, I ought to say that my Bachelor of Science degree, what I showed was in my study there, was that the heels up occurs in these months on one stud farm in Newmarket. It was 373 foals. That's a big study group. And, and then clubfoot comes later. So clubfoot, when we can see this difference in angle between these two, and a broken forward and very steep angle. So you might say, well, this clearly looks seasonal. And you can see from this graph I've, I've put underneath the time, the timeline is actually months. So you might say, well, it's clearly seasonal. This is something to do with the grass. It's sometimes something to do with the sun. It's sometimes something to do with the rain. And that's what I thought when I saw it. I have to tell you, I don't think it's seasonal. We breed our racehorses seasonally. We introduce seasonality. We don't have any foals unless we're really out of luck. Uh, before the middle of January, and it's extraordinarily rare, and I didn't have a single foal that was born in June in those 373 foals. So we breed them in this tight group, and this problem occurs in a tight time span. Now, the good news is, for any of you, and as I say, it probably varies from stud farm to stud farm, from country to country, is that if any of your foals have not gone up and left the ground uh, with their heels now, it's extremely unlikely they will do because uh, the latest uh, date there in July was actually the 4th of July. A day I really celebrated, gentlemen, as we always do in this country, don't we? <laughs> so I, I always remember that as the 4th of July. And actually, my February foal, believe it or not, was February the 28th, which so it shows you this is an even tighter group. All right, let's have a quick look at uh, hoof loading. And uh, actually, I'm going to swap through that because I just want to, in the last couple of minutes, uh, look at some of the stuff I got on 
uh, hoof growth rate and my control group, look, they were growing more on the lateral side. So the lateral side is this side, the outside of the foot, with my acquired flexural deformity group, totally different pattern. They were growing far less at the toe. So in other words, when we see a club foot and we say, well, it's growing so much heel, maybe it's not so. Maybe it's just growing less toe. I think it's probably a combination of both. Uh, when we looked at uh, the compression rate, how much that hoof squeezed, here we saw that it was squeezed far more on the medial side than on the lateral side. And if we think of that weight bearing, we shouldn't be surprised. But in our acquired flexural deformity group, they were getting compressed way more, especially on the right foot, at the dorsum, so at the toe. So again, we shouldn't be surprised that this club foot is pushing into the ground and we're getting more compression there. And so that's bringing about this change in shape. And finally, just to show the loading, and that's the numeric data, uh, not the visual one I showed, this is uh, medial versus lateral. So this adds up to 100%, and it's how the weighting is shared. And again, uh, sorry, we would see that medially they are bearing more weight, but also uh, caudally more than dorsal, although a difference on the right side. And all the way through, there was a difference right to left. And so we can see our acquired flexural deformity group uh, is really uh, bearing most of the weight at the dorsum. So, just to uh, sum up, um, hoof renewal is slowing in these folds. It's very fast, but it is slowing. Hoof growth is slowing. The hoof is changing shape, and the loading is changing. So the way our foal is bearing weight is changing. And that's probably as much to do uh, with, the, with uh, myotendinous changes. In other words, it's muscular changes, I think. The hoof angle is declining, and you can see that it carries on all the way till there too, uh, but it's really declining very rapidly at this early stage. And taking us right back to the start, the hoof structure is also changing. Now, I showed you the little foal there uh, at the start of the... Uh, <laughs> I know there's one person who knows what it is. And there's a picture of it winning the derby uh, three years later, and that's Australia, so I had to take the opportunity... Uh, to show that, and because I'm not usually about, I have to tell you, to take pictures of foals as they're born. That's not usually part of my job, but fortunately we had one hell of a good party, and that was on the front of the party invite. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry if I've rushed it, and I'm sorry if there's an awful lot of graphs in there, but thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>